Let's open our Bibles to the book of Ezra, chapter 1, once again. Ezra, chapter 1. And um, we've spent some time considering that the land of Israel, or the land of Palestine, belongs to the Jews. And the, you know, the only organized state, if you will, in its history was the kingdom of Israel, as God had led them uh, to possess it. Uh, there never has been an Arab nation, per se, there, an Arab state, or any other nation controlling that land and making it a, a state or, or a political nation with its own capital, except Israel. They're the only ones who have ever occupied that land as their homeland with a, with a capital. Um, go back, if you will, to the book of Deuteronomy. Um, let's read just a few verses there. God promised that land to the Jew, and uh, it belongs to the Jew. That's going to be where his inheritance begins. Deuteronomy chapter 1, and let's read verses 7 and 8. Uh, Turn you and take your journey, and go to the mount of the Amorites, unto all the places nigh thereunto, in the plain, in the hills, and in the vale, and in the south, and by the seaside, to the land of the Canaanites, and unto Lebanon, unto the great river, the river Euphrates. Behold, I have set the land before you. Go in and possess the land which the Lord swear unto your fathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, to give unto them and to their seed after them. Look down there at verse uh, 21. Behold, the Lord thy God has set the land before thee. Go up and possess it, as the Lord God of thy fathers hath said unto thee, Fear not, neither... Uh, be discouraged. And uh, verse 31, And in the wilderness where thou hast seen how that the Lord thy God bare thee as a man doth bear his son in all the way that ye went until ye came unto this place. Um, chapter 3, Deuteronomy 3, and um, verse 9, or verse 19, excuse me, but your wives and your little ones and your cattle, for I know that you have much cattle, shall abide in your cities, which I have given you. And chapter 4, verse 1. Now therefore hearken, O Israel, unto the statutes and unto the judgments which I teach you, for to do them, that ye may live and go in and possess the land which the Lord God of your fathers giveth you. He didn't give it to the Muslim, he didn't give it to the Arabs, he didn't give it to the Egyptians, he gave it to the Jew. And uh, after being driven out by the Romans in 70 A.D., and then dispersed through all nations for 1,900 years, when the Jews entered again in 1948, there was no such thing as a Palestinian state there. There was no Palestinian capital. And uh, they barely found 900,000, uh, quote-unquote, Palestinians living in that land. And they are simply displaced Arabs who should be able to be to enter into any other Arab country without without uh, difficulty but uh, they become a political cause and uh, no Arab country wants the so-called Palestinians coming into their country to immigrate there and live there and uh, the truth is the Palestinians that live in Israel now they don't want to go to those countries their life is much better living in the state of Israel they have the right to vote, they can drive cars, they have modern jobs, they, a number of things which they wouldn't have uh, living in, in uh, Arab nations. And uh, so they've been used as a political uh, football between Israel and uh, the Muslim world. But there is no such thing as a two-state solution. The land doesn't belong to anyone except the Jew. But um, the USA and the, the European Union and the United Nations are making their Middle East policies based on a fantasy, based on a fantasy that somehow that land uh, belongs equally to, to the Jew and to the Arab. It does not. It belongs to the Jew. And you notice that God defined their, their, their territory all the way over to the river Euphrates. So even the land that we call the modern-day Iraq, where the river Euphrates runs through, uh, that doesn't belong to the Muslims or the Arabs. That belongs to the Jew, too. And someday his land uh, grant is going to spread out and cover the entire world. 
But um, one day, Christ will have to trample, and I think we mentioned this last week, he'll trample on the graves of Muslims buried in cemeteries outside the eastern gate of Jerusalem as he re-enters to set upon his throne and set himself up as the Messiah in his kingdom. But let's move on. We got as far as verse 7. Also Cyrus the king brought forth the vessels of the house of the Lord, which Nebuchadnezzar had brought forth out of Jerusalem, and had put them in the house of his gods. And then verses 8 through 11. Even those did Cyrus, king of Persia, bring forth by the hand of Mithridath, the treasurer, and numbered them unto Sheshbazar, the prince of Judah. And this is the number of them, thirty chargers of gold, a thousand chargers of silver, nine and twenty knives, thirty basins of gold, silver basins of a second sort, four hundred and ten, and other vessels a thousand. All the vessels of gold and of silver were five thousand and four hundred. All these did Sheshbazar bring up with them of the captivity that were brought up from Babylon unto Jerusalem. And uh, these will be the vessels that include the ones Belshazzar uh, used in his feast, Daniel chapter 5, verses 1 through 4, before God killed him. Uh, the knives, mentioned in verse 9, they do not count as vessels. And the grand total of items, 5,400, uh, they're not all enumerated by Ezra in these three, three or four verses here. Chapter 8, verse 27, which we don't we won't turn to you, also mentions copper vessels as precious as gold. So uh, the Bible-believing viewpoint would be that the Lord's numbers are correct, even without a detailed list being provided to us. Uh, the chargers, verse 9, they're like the ones uh, Mrs. Herod served uh, John the Baptist's head on. They're uh, wide, big, hollowed-out dishes. And they're in Matthew 14. And uh, uh, the, the uh, basins are covered goblets. Think of a German beer stein with something covering the top of it. And it's not, un, it's not completely unlike uh, basins in the uh, Bible's usage of it. And uh, let's go into chapter 2. <clears throat> let's read verses 1 through 12. Now these are the children of the province that went up out of the captivity of those which had been carried away, whom Nebuchadnezzar the king of Babylon had carried away unto Babylon, and came again unto Jerusalem and Judah, every one unto his city, which came with Zerubbabel, Jeshua, Nehemiah, Sariah, Realeah, Mordecai, Bilshan, Mizpar, Bigvai, Rehum, Baanah, the number of the men of the people of Israel. The children of Parash, 2,170 and 2. The children of Shephatiah, 370 and 2. The children of Era, 770 and 5. The children of Pehath Moab, of the children of Jeshua and Joab, 2,812. The children of Elam, 1,250 and 4. The children of Zatu, 940 and 5. The children of Zechai, 703 score. The children of Bani, 640 and 2. The children of Bibi, 620 and 3. The children of Asgad, 1,220 and 2. Let's pause for a moment uh, to say that this long, uh, boring, dreary list of names and numbers um, it does not match the one found in the book of Nehemiah. Uh, when he checked the registry, later on in Nehemiah 7, which we'll get to eventually. Uh, Nehemiah's list in can included camels and horses and asses and singing men and singing women and men servants and maid servants in Nehemiah uh, chapter 7. And between the two books, there are a number of discrepancies in the lists, but this does not prove a contradiction in the scriptures. Notice that verse 1 said... Uh, of those which had been carried away, whom Nebuchadnezzar the king of Babylon had carried away unto Babylon. Nehemiah's list later on turns out to be longer than Ezra's list. Uh, many of the names do not match, um, but this has to be due to the fact that there were children born in Babylon 
who weren't carried away to begin with, and uh, many people died in Babylon. Some may have been born en route back to the land of Israel. More people took the trip uh, to Palestine than registered to take it in Persia before they left. Uh, look at chapter 7, real quickly in verse 7. Ezra 7, verse 7 says, And there went up some of the children of Israel, and of the priests, and the Levites, and the singers, and the porters, and the Nethanims, unto Jerusalem in the seventh year of Artaxerxes the king. Um, many may have gone up with Ezra who were added to Nehemiah's list later on. And so uh, we don't assume that the Bible's uh, incorrect. Um, that's what modern critics of the Bible do. They assume, well, two things sound like they're contradictory. I try to address a lot of common state, common problems in my contradiction book. But the more you read the Bible, the more contradictory things you see. And it's simply a matter of someone being very a careful student of the Bible and being patient and compare both lists and all the circumstantial evidence that may contribute to understanding why these lists don't match. Um, but let's continue, beginning at verse 13. The children of uh, Adonikim, 660 and 6. The children of Big Vai, 2056. The children of Aden, 450 and 4. The children of Ater of Hezekiah, 90 and 8. The children of Bezai, 320 and 3. The children of Jorah, 112. The children of Hashem, 220 and 3. The children of Gibar, 90 and 5. The children of Bethlehem, 120 and 3. The men of Netophah, 50 and 6. The men of Anathoth, 120 and 8. <coughs> The children of Asmaveth, 40 and 2. The children of Kirjath, Kirjath Arim, Kirjath Arim um, Kephirah and Birah, 740 and 3. The children of Ramah and Gaba, 620 and 1. The men of Michmas, 120 and 2. The men of Bethel and Ai, 220 and 3. The children of Nebo, 50 and 2. The children of Magbish, 150 and 6. The children of the other Elam, uh, against uh, verse, with verse 7, 1,250 and 4. The children of Harem, 320. The children of Lod, Hated, and Ono, 720 and 5. The children of Jericho, 340 and 5. The children of Senea, 3,630. One reason for saying that this list is long and boring and dreary is because it's true. <laughs> um, and uh, a great deal of the Bible is that way, but a great deal of life is that way. And um, lists of genealogies and all the uh, temple measurements in the book of Ezekiel, they can really put you to sleep if you're suffering from uh, you know, your, your insomnia. But another reason might be to also gauge the opinions of modern Bible critics, professing Christians who prefer the Living Bible or they prefer the Reader's Digest Bible. How many remember the Reader's Digest Bible? It came out in the late 70s, early 80s, and it was published by the Reader's Digest Company. I think they took the Revised Standard Version. And anything that was uh, repetitive, repetitious lists of names and so forth, they just edited it out. And uh, condense it. That's their that's that's their forte is uh, editing things down and cutting it down to size so you can read it while you're in the bathroom. That's about all. <laughs> but but to see how people are see how faithful people are to all the scriptures, and you can gauge that by the way people get weary or they get tired of reading all these lists. Anyone can find movies and TV shows in which the story plays out and the whole mystery is resolved in 60 minutes or 90 minutes, but real life isn't like that. And um, no average cop who's 15 or 20 pounds overweight with a utility belt and a firearm, a sidearm, and a, a bulletproof vest is going to chase down a suspect on foot uh, like you see him in the movies. And then down an alleyway where the suspect runs into a, bl a block wall and he leaps up over the wall and the 
the cop, cop is able to leap up after him and chase him down until he catches it. That doesn't happen in real life. And uh, the high-speed car chases in big cities like New York or San Francisco or Los Angeles, they're not going to last more than five minutes at the most through the busy streets of, of cities like that. And yet you see some car chase in the streets of New York City, and they go on and on for blocks and blocks and blocks and miles and miles. And there's always a pile of garbage and some trash can that the, the car hits. You know, that's a, that's a popular stunt. And, um, but it doesn't happen like that in real life. But people want things to come to them quickly. And, and too many people want their spiritual life to be, to move and progress quickly and without much effort on their part. But real life isn't like that. And um, much of life is just not that interesting. Uh, let's continue. What's interesting about this, starting at verse 36? The priests, the children of Judea, and the house of Jeshua, 970 and 3. The children of Immer, 1,050 and 2. The children of Pasher, 1,240 and 7. The, uh, the children of Haram, 1,017. The Levites, the children of Jeshua, and Cadmiel of the children of uh, Hodaviah, 70 and 4. The singers, the children of Asaph, 120 and 8. The children of the porters, the children of Shalom, the children of Ater, the children of Talmon, the children of Akub, the children of Hattita, the children of Shobai, and all, um, and 130 and 9. The Nethanims, the children of Ziha, the children of Hasapah, the children of Tabaoth, the children of Kiros, the children of Siaia, the children of Padon, the children of Lebanon, the children of Hagabah, the children of Akub, the children of Hagab, the children of Shalmei, the children of Hanan, the children of Giddel, the children of Gehar, the children of Rhea, the children of Reason, the children of Nakoda, the children of Gazam, the children of Uzzah, the children of Hasia, the children of Besai, the children of Asna, the children of Mahunim, the children of Nefushim, the children of uh, Bakbuk, the children of Hakapha, the children of Harher, the children of Basleth, the children of Mahida, the children of Harsha, the children of Barkus, the children of Sisera, the children of uh, Thama, the children of Nezia, the children of uh, Hatipha. Uh, nothing interesting about any of that. <laughs> and yet God puts it in his book. I think the presence of all of that detail is one of the things that convinces me that this is God's book. Because if a man was going to write a book or write some religious thing, he would eliminate as much of that, he would try to minimize that as much as possible. So it's, it's got to be written by God because it contains so much detail that modern man would find to largely useless and pointless. But... Um, you know, none of that is remotely connected to prayer or worship or moral standards or anything religious, and that's what people think the Bible is only about. Um, it's just like the last several chapters in Exodus, all the ouches and the tatches and the selvages and the sockets and the pillars and the staves and the badgers and uh, ram's skins and the couplings. It seems like a great waste of time to the modern man. And modern Bibles uh, try to liven it up by replacing King James words with something they think is more contemporary. Many times the word they replace it with is even more obscure. You know, the King James Bible uses the word uh, butter. And uh, some of the modern versions in those same verses replace that word with curds. If you tell your 12 or 13-year-old kid to go down to the Seder Brothers and get some curds for it, he's not going to have any idea what you're talking about. Um, verse 55, and we'll go down to verse 65. The children of Solomon's servants, the children of Sotei, the children of Sophereth, the children of Peruda, the children of uh, Jaelah, the children of Darkon, the children of Giddel, the children of Shephatiah, the children of Hatil, the children of uh, Pokereth, um, of Zebian, the children of Ami, all the Nethanims, and the children of Solomon's servants, were 390 and 2. And these were they which went up from Telmelah, Telharsah, Chirab, Adan, and Immer, 
but they could not show their father's house and their seed, whether they were of Israel. The children of Delea, the children of Tobiah, the children of Nakoda, 650 and 2, and of the children of the priests, the children of Habaiah, the children of Koz, the children of Barzillai, which took a wife of the daughters of Barzillai, the Gileadite, and was called after their name. These sought their register among those that were reckoned by genealogy, but they were not found. Therefore were they as polluted, put from the priesthood. And the Tershathah, that's another name for Nehemiah, which we'll get to when we get to Nehemiah, sent unto them that they should not eat of the most holy things till there stood up a priest with Urim and with Thummim. That's not Joseph Smith in the Book of Mormon. The whole congregation together was forty and two thousand three hundred and three score, beside their servants and their maids, of whom there were seven thousand three hundred thirty and seven, and there were among them two hundred singing men and singing women. We'll stop right there. Um, when I was reading and trying to prepare for this, um, in Dr. Ruckman's commentary, which I've been using, uh, he makes a he he talks a great deal about how tedious and monotonous much of the Bible seems to be, but it's because it's the it's the book God gave to the world, not the book that a man would give to the world. And um, you you can't just say, well, God didn't know what He was doing when He included all of those names. When he included, included all those details in the tabernacle and in the temple and uh, the temple in the future listed in the, described in the book of uh, Ezekiel and uh, all the list of names, Christ's genealogy in the New Testament and all of those things that seem <clears throat> pointless and have very little meaning for us today. And he said he had read through the Bible about over 90 times. And suddenly a verse jumped out at him, like I had never done before. I thought, that's worth us looking at. Go to the book of Ezekiel, chapter 20. We're just about finished for this evening. Ezekiel 20. And uh, he said he was reading this verse after reading the Bible over 90 times. Suddenly... This one stood out to him like it had never done before. Uh, Ezekiel 20, verse 15. Yet also I lifted up my hand unto them in the wilderness, that I would not bring them into the land which I had given them, flowing with milk and honey. And this is the last, this last part of which caught his eye, which is the glory of all lands. And he said, having... Um, had the chance to travel around the world a lot of places um, to think of Israel as the glory of all lands when there are places far more beautiful in the world than the land of Israel. A barren uh, desert that needed to be cultivated and hydrated, which the Jews have been doing since 1948, but nothing but desert and rough terrain for sheep herders and goat herders for so many centuries. Um, he said there are places in Austria and places in uh, other parts of the Far East and other parts of the world and parts here in the United States that are far more beautiful than the land of Israel. I mean, how could God call that the glory of all lands? And then he began to think that... Um, The first, uh, the first time the word love shows up in the Bible, Genesis 22, has to do with a father's love for his son, Abraham and Isaac. And uh, that's a picture of the heavenly father's love for his son. And uh, he that hath the son hath life, and he that hath not the son of God hath not life. And uh, God, the father, is interested in his son. And he's interested in his son's future. And that is where his son will one day reign uh, in glory and splendor. And when that day comes, the land of Israel won't resemble anything barren or dry or uh, dried up and depleted. It will blossom and flourish like no other land in the world has ever flourished. It's just a matter of time. And so if anything 
uh, in the Bible, it seems, like I say, tedious and wearisome, as even slightly, has some slight or distant connection to the genealogy of Christ or to the person of Christ, God considers it worth putting into his book. Or the identity of Christ, the, the, the identity of the tribes of Israel and the Jews, God considered it worth putting into his book. And uh, woe be to us if we try to second guess God and say, well, that, that's a waste of my time. I don't have time to read that. But the Bible says there's a blessing to that person that reads, the book of Revelation chapter 1. So it doesn't promise you that you're going to understand it all. But if you're faithful to read it, God will teach you little by little as you go. And, and don't give up on God. And he certainly won't give up on you.